Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Evaluation and Treatment of the Infertile Male. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few quick items about today's event. First, all physicians in attendance will receive a AMA PRA Category 1 credit, and all other providers will receive a certificate of completion for one contact hour credit. Additionally, we encourage, encourage you to submit questions to Dr. Vaughn and Dr. Carasquillo using the questions section of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Speakers, Dr. Dennis Vaughn is a reproductive endocrinologist and the Director of Clinical Research at Boston IVF, where he leads groundbreaking studies to improve outcomes in fertility treatment. Dr. Vaughn's recent research in conjunction with Harvard University include the study of twinning and assisted reproduction and selection methods of sperm and genetics, genetics underlying male infertility. Dr. Vaughn sees a wide spectrum of fertility patient, patients and has a particular interest in the treatment of patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS, male factor infertility, those with complex fertility issues, as well as fertility preservation, both elective and cancer-related fertility preservation. Dr. Vaughn strongly believes in a personalized, evidence-based approach to fertility treatment. Dr. Carasquillo is a board-certified urologist and expert in the field of male fertility in men's health, sexual health. He completed graduate training in molecular biology through Harvard University and obtained his MD from Harvard Medical School. Following, following his urology residency at Boston Medical Center, he completed a rigorous fellowship in male reproductive medicine and surgery at the University of Miami and returned to Boston as faculty in the Division of Urology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Beth Israel Deaconess Needham and part-time instructor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Carasquillo practices urology with an emphasis on men's reproductive and sexual health issues. He has published multiple peer review articles in these areas and has presented at national meetings on a variety of related topics. Dr. Carasquillo is also an advocate for improving education, outreach and access to uro urologic care for LGBTQIA plus patients. Okay, let's get started. started. I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Vaughn. Great, thanks Alyssa. So as mentioned, the title of today's talk is the evaluation treatment of the infertile male. So the agenda for today will be to give a brief introduction to infertility in general and testing specifically in the heterosexual couple for the purposes of this talk. I'll then hand the podium over to Dr. Carasquillo, who will review male reproduction, uh, specifically the anatomy and physiology, along with um, the prevalence and etiology of male infertility, the evaluation um, that he commonly performs, and then discussing some treatment and surgical uh, advances, specifically as they pertain to male fertility treatment. So in general, uh, the heterosexual couples should seek infertility evaluation if they have not successfully become pregnant after one year of unprotected intercourse in couples uh, where the female is younger than age 35 and less than uh, if the couple is if the female in the couple is above the age of 35 then that time frame is shortened to six months this does not take into account however if there's a significant medical history um, either on the female or on the male side so on the female side specifically um, if there's a menstrual history um, significant for oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea, then that couple should be seen sooner. If the female has a known history of advanced stage endometriosis, that's obviously a significant risk factor for infertility and she should be seen sooner. If on the male side, there is a significant risk factor for infertility or subfertility, then couples should be seen sooner also. And Dr. Carasquillo will talk a little bit more about that. And in general, we prefer to see these patients on the sooner side if they haven't gotten pregnant and they haven't hit the six month or 12, year, 12 month mark, um, they should still see us if there are red flags or risk factors in their history that um, could signify um, an issue or difficulty with conception in the future. Where do we come up with this six or 12 month mark? It's somewhat arbitrary, but in general, we quote patients a fecundity of about 20%. So about 20% of all heterosexual couples um, engaging in active 
unprotected intercourse will conceive within the first month. Each subsequent month, that 20% fecundity drops somewhat. And so in month two, about a 16% um, additional patients will conceive successfully. 64% will remain uh, not pregnant. In month three, a further 13% will become pregnant and 51% will remain not pregnant. And where this cutoff for that six month and 12 month mark uh, occurs, again, it's somewhat arbitrary. As we know, there's nothing magical about the 35 uh, year old cutoff on the female side. It's a continuous decline in fecundity um, throughout the uh, females advancing reproductive years. Not only is it more difficult for the couple to conceive when the, as the female ages, but also the possibility or probability of remaining pregnant decreases as the female ages. And so we typically will quote miscarriage rates of about 15 to 20% if a couple, uh, if a heterosexual couple conceives spontaneously. But this is really applicable to the younger female. In the older female, for example, you can see on my graph here, women over the age of 40 have about a 35 to 40% chance of miscarriage, and that goes up um, even more as the female ages and if, if, she's a, if the couple are um, successfully able to conceive in the first instance. The reason for this is largely related to chromosomal aneuploidy within the oocyte or within the egg. Now, there's a, an association with advancing paternal age as well and effects on infertility, but it's not nearly as dramatic as the effects of advancing maternal age on the fertility of a heterosexual couple. And as I said, largely related to chromosomal aneuploidy within the egg. As we know, we have to have the egg and the sperm combining 23 chromosomes from mom, 23 chromosomes from dad to create a 46XX or 46XY uh, embryo. This packaging doesn't always um, go perfectly, as we know, and the likelihood of chromosomal abnormalities increases as the female gets older, and that's largely related to meiotic errors and increase in meiotic errors in the oocyte or in the egg. And so we can see this is derived from the IVF population, but it's, it's uh, pertinent for the spontaneously conceived population as well. When we have a couple come in where the female is 29 to 30 years of age, about 25% of all the embryos that we create from that couple will be chromosomally aneuploid. And typically we see that clinically when we transfer an aneuploid embryo, those embryos typically will not implant at all. We get failure of implantation, or if they do implant, they result in an early loss, either a biochemical pregnancy or an early clinical miscarriage. Obviously, those checkpoints that exist in nature are not perfect, and we do have pregnancies that continue with chromosomal aneuploidy, but that's less likely. When we see a 40-year-old patient or a 42-year-old patient coming in, unfortunately, it's a different story. We see that 60 to 70 percent of all embryos created at that age um, are chromosomally aneuploid. And we see this again clinically in a spontaneously conceived patient population where the risk for something like Down syndrome or trisomy 21 increases dramatically with increasing female age from 1 in 350 at age 35 to 1 in 30 at age 45. The reasons for infertility are quite varied, um, but in general, we used to think it was a third male, a third female, a third unknown, but it's, it's a little more subtle, a little more nuanced than that. Um, female infertility accounts for at least 50%, and those are cases that we can find out what is going on with that female, whether it's ovulatory dysfunction, tubal obstruction, uh, clear uterine factors with large fibroids, et cetera. On the male side, it's at least 30 to 50%. Um, and if it's not completely causatory on the male, it's contributing to the couple's inability to conceive. And so we'll see that often in a heterosexual couple, that there'll be a very subtle male factor that may not meet strict criteria for male factor infertility and a mild, subtle female factor 
Um, and it's those two factors together, you think of a Venn diagram, those two Venn diagrams that overlap make it more difficult for that couple um, to conceive. When we think about testing for infertility, we base it around what has to happen typically for normal conception. And so we have to have ejaculation of the vagina at the correct time every month. Those sperm have to be good quality in terms of motility, morphology, and count. The sperm have to be able to swim through the cervix and into the female reproductive tract and from the endometrial cavity through the cornea of the fallopian tube to the end of the fallopian tube or the ampulla of the fallopian tube where it needs to meet an egg in any given month. And so we have to have ovulation at the correct time. We have to have patent tubes, normal uh, uterus, um, and the egg quality itself has to be has to be good. And inside the uterine cavity, when the fertilized egg that's now an embryo tracks, makes its way back through the fallopian tube um, in the reverse direction to the sperm, we have to have implantation in the uterine cavity on day six to day nine after fertilization. And so again, any polyps or any fibroids inside the uterine cavity will affect implantation, will affect our success rates. ACOG and the American Society of Reproductive Medicine came together in 2019 to publish this uh, document, which is, is actually really well done. It's the Infertility Workup for the Women's Health Specialist. Just to summarize it briefly, um, they recommend, as we all would, a history and physical examination. Uh, they recommend additional testing for the etiology of infertility to include an ovarian reserve assessment, uh, looking for ovulatory dysfunction, if it exists, tubal factors, so confirm that the tubes are patent, looking at the anatomy, and then performing a semen analysis. And the semen analysis is relatively rudimentary, but it's it's um, the best method we have currently for the evaluation of, of the male. So at a minimum, if a, patient, if a heterosexual couple presents to you with infertility, subfertility, or even um, has been trying for several months and hasn't had success, we should be recommending that we confirm that the patient is actually ovulating. Now, if the patient has regular menses, they're ovulating. If it's clockwork, they're ovulating. We don't even need to confirm it the vast majority of the time. But if you wanted to, we would see urinary LH kits turning positive, because urinary LH, um, which they can get over the counter from Amazon or their pharmacy, will confirm an LH surge and therefore ovulation. You can also check a luteal phase progesterone. That should be elevated. It doesn't necessarily have to be day 21, but three or four days after ovulation, you'll see the progesterone level being elevated above three nanograms per milliliter. We generally say that it's less helpful because it's more subjective when patients um, check cervical mucus and, and basal body temperature. We should also confirm tubal patency because obviously the patient can be trying getting everything else right in terms of timing intercourse with ovulation, but if the tubes aren't patent, there's no way of the egg and the sperm meeting. Um, and lastly, we should confirm that there is sperm available. Again, we don't want to, a patient to get frustrated trying for months and months and months when there's a clear male factor that we just haven't evaluated. And so um, I would encourage you all when the patient presents, um, when the couple presents for an evaluation that you send off a semen analysis to at least get a rudimentary evaluation on the male and confirm that there's actually viable sperm in the ejaculate. And so with that, I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Carrasquillo to delve deeper into the evaluation and treatment of the infertile male. Great. Uh, thank you, Dennis. So, um, yeah, so to begin with, um, so we're going to go through just normal physiology, um, prevalence and etiology. Uh, we'll talk about the evaluation and also um, how uh, a reproductive urologist can be pretty instrumental in the management of um, infertility for a couple. Um, I'll try to advance my slide. Dr. Karras, can you just make your slides a little bit bigger in for presentation mode? Let's see. So this is... Uh, Is that okay? I still see your screen, uh, or I could do it if you would like me to try to present it. Oh, there we go. Um, Perfect. 
Thank you. So, okay, great. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, to begin with, um, so the male reproductive system is responsible for you know two major things: um, sperm production as well as sperm transport. Um, so sperm are produced in the testicle in minute structures called seminiferous tubules. That's an electron micrograph. So these are very minute uh, tubular structures. Um, and sperm uh, are produced in the periphery at the basement membrane and then mature entering the lumen towards the center. Um, as they are produced in the testicle, they then enter the epididymis where they mature and traverse through the vas deferens into the pelvis and are stored at the level of the um, vasal ampulla, which is just uh, behind the prostate gland. Um, on ejaculation, then uh, secretions from the prostate gland, uh, the seminal vesicles, as well as this uh, spermatozoa from the uh, vasal ampulla will be emitted uh, via the urethra. Um, in terms of uh, endocrine physiology, um, so uh, under the um, instruction of the hypothalamus, um, the anterior pituitary will release uh, two hormones, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which both speak to the testicle. In the testicle, the FSH hormone will act on Sertoli cells to induce spermatogenesis. Sertoli cells are the uh, supportive cells adjacent to the basement membrane of the seminiferous tubules. And under the influence of luteinizing hormone, the Leydig cells in the testis in the interstitial spaces will excrete, um, sorry, secrete testosterone. And testosterone promotes this entire process. There is negative feedback inhibition. So from the Sertoli cells, the hormone inhibin will feedback negatively on FSH at the anterior pituitary, while testosterone um, will feedback negatively regarding LH secretion. Um, so again, just to um, review a couple of important points, so up to 15% of couples suffer from some uh, degree of infertility, and a male factor has been implicated in anywhere from 30 to even up to 50% of cases, uh, with up to 5 to 10% of the male population therefore being um, potentially infertile or subfertile. Um, in terms of the etiology, the, there are numerous potential causes, and the list is very extensive, but just to kind of give a brief overview um, in terms of the most common etiology, varicocele, which we'll talk about a little bit later, represents probably the most uh, often identified problem. Many cases can be idiopathic uh, infections, uh, which generally can cause issues with sperm production, but more so scarring in the reproductive system and obstructive pathology. There can be genetic issues related to sperm production, endocrine issues, et cetera. So in order to evaluate the male, it's very important to get a extensive medical and surgical history, as well as a developmental history. Uh, so you want to know about onset of puberty, uh, their sexual development, et cetera. Um, in terms of medications, it's certainly important on, in particular, men uh, who may use anabolic steroids um, or um, other drugs that may cause endocrinopathy, and also their habits um, in terms of uh, smoking or alcohol, et cetera. The physical exam is essential. Uh, you want to look at general um, uh, you know, sexual maturity, um, virilization, the size of the testicles, uh, and that um, all uh, normal reproductive structures are palpable. Semen analysis is essential as well. And typically, we obtain two semen analyses at least um, four to six weeks apart. Hormone evaluation can be uh, very helpful, especially if there is an identified semen analysis abnormality. Uh, genetic, genetic counseling and evaluation uh, can be extremely helpful as, um, as applicable. And then imaging studies can also occasionally add additional information. And again, just to recap on the physical exam, so the general appearance, um, be on the lookout for any possible gynecomastia, which may indicate an endocrine uh, issue, uh, normal virilization, axillary and pubic hair, and then testis volume and consistency. But this is rather important as testis volume is predominantly a direct uh, result of how much sperm production is going on in the testicle. So if there is a problem with spermatogenesis, more often than not, the testis volume will be decreased from normal. Also, you want to examine the epididymis, uh, assess, you know, it should be a relatively flat and small fleshy object behind the testicle, but an indurated or enlarged epididymis may indicate obstruction. And then also, the presence of varicocele. And this can be somewhat challenging unless the varicocele is very large, uh, but these are again uh, the most commonly identified and treatable form of um, male fertility or cause of male infertility. With regards to semen analysis, again, we want to get to with an appropriate abstinence period of about three to five days. Um, the uh, pellet 
um, or uh, the sample can be centrifuged to obtain a concentrated pellet if no sperm are seen initially uh, on semen analysis. And also consider getting a post-ejaculate urinalysis to assess if there are any, uh, for sperm, if there are any risk factors for what's called retrograde ejaculation, where sperm is emitted but uh, does not um, proceed in an anterograde fashion through the urethra and may be ejaculated retrograde into the bladder. And this is relevant for men with a history of bladder or neck or prostate surgery use of alpha blockers, such as tamsulosin for enlarged prostate uh, or other issues. Um, also men with a history of diabetes, in which case this pathology would be neuropathic in origin. So in terms of how we establish what is normal on a semen analysis, this is based on a normal distribution of men where the um, WHO has established the cutoff of um, 5%, um, so that men who have um, are in the fifth percentile or lower in terms of semen volume, sperm concentration, total count, motility, et cetera. Those, that is how those numbers were established. And this is looking at men who are uh, documented fertile fathers. Um, so what does a semen analysis truly represent? It is the most useful lab for evaluating male infertility. However, it is not effective at reliably predicting fertility unless it is completely azospermic. So even a man who has severe oligospermia, which is a reduced sperm count, still has the potential for fatherhood. It does not mean that they are infertile, but it just means that they are likely to have a more difficult, uh, you know, greater difficulty in conceiving. In terms of laboratory studies, in particular for men with an abnormal semen analysis, we want to look at testosterone level as this supports the entire reproductive uh, system. Their FSH and LH levels, estradiol can be important, especially if there are any clinical signs of endocrinopathy. Prolactin is generally checked um, if there's any concerning symptoms of pituitary um, disorder or for a severely low testosterone, less than 150 nanograms per deciliter, where the normal cutoff is generally accepted at about 300. And also um, in terms of addressing endocrine problems. So men who have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, you can consider clomiphene therapy. This will cause an increase in FSH and LH secretion. Uh, for men with elevated prolactin, uh, referral to endocrinology would be appropriate for further evaluation and treatment. And then for those who have a gonadotropin deficiency unresponsive to other treatments, you can use recombinant FSH or even human chorionic gonadotropin, which is an analog of luteinizing hormone, essentially replacing both gonadotropins. So just to kind of put some of this into perspective with the endocrine uh, pathway. Uh, so again, um, testosterone feeds back negatively at the anterior pituitary. Estrogen uh, actually does the same. And we can intervene here with clomiphene. Um, prolactin secretion actually uh, inhibits uh, FSH and LH as well. So these have inhibitory effects at the level of the pituitary. And clomiphene citrate blocks uh, the effect of estrogen at that level, therefore stimulating further FSH and LH secretion. In terms of imaging studies, um, these are an extension of the physical exam, but should not replace a good physical exam. So a scrotal ultrasound will give a, a relatively accurate assessment of testicular volume. It will also look at varicoceles and may I be able to identify varicoceles uh, in a patient where an exam was rather challenging. So say, for example, they may be obese or they have a very small volume scrotum, and it's just very difficult to palpate or visualize a varicocele. Also, um, we do know that testicular cancer is um, associated with uh, male infertility as well due to the underlying genetic abnormalities that produce um, germ cell tumors. These can also render men subfertile, and so an ultrasound may be helpful in elucidating if there's any other pathology within the testis. Transrectal ultrasound can be instrumental in particular for obstructive pathology. This is particularly important if a gentleman has a low semen volume or an acidic pH in the semen. Um, this implies a blockage at the level of the ejaculatory duct. Secretions from the seminal vesicles will increase the pH to a more alkaline level. Um, so if there's an obstruction uh, that uh, prevents uh, secretion of these fluids, uh, then you'll have a low volume and acidic pH analysis and a transrectal ultrasound can identify obstruction by looking at the caliber of the seminal vesicles and the ejaculatory ducts. In terms of major advances in the field that have really um, 
uh, increase our ability to treat a variety of male patients with infertility. Um, the advent of ICSC was instrumental in allowing us to use a very limited number of sperm to allow men to conceive with their partners. Also, the development of microdissection to secular sperm extraction, uh, which is a means of surgically retrieving um, sperm in men with non-obstructive azoospermia, has been very helpful in allowing us to get even these small numbers that can really be um, life-changing in terms of a uh, couple's fertility uh, journey. And additionally, um, epididymal sperm aspiration, which is a means of getting sperm, uh, high quality, uh, motile and mature sperm for men with obstructive pathology um, has made it much easier for these patients to conceive. So uh, I just wanna go through a couple of illustrative cases um, that will demonstrate how a reproductive urologist can be helpful in a couple with infertility. So this is actually a patient that I shared with Dr. Vaughn. It's a 33-year-old gentleman. His wife is also 33. They have never been pregnant before, and she has no known female factor in fertility. They've been trying to conceive for over one year, and he has no prior fraternity with any other partners. In terms of his uh, risk factors, he has no history of genitourinary infections, history of anabolic steroid use or cryptorchidism, or other potential exposures, no history of trauma, and there's no relevant family history of male infertility. He is otherwise healthy and has had some unrelated orthopedic surgeries in the past, and he, has, uh, he does not smoke. He did two prior semen analyses um, about two weeks apart, and the first analysis was notable for a normal sperm concentration of 20 million per cc, but a decreased motility of 15% where normal is considered above 42%, and a total motile sperm count of 12 million, which is low, and normal is considered greater than 15 million and morphology was somewhat decreased where normal is greater than 4% normal morphology. A second semen analysis demonstrated still a motility defect at 25% and low morphology. On his exam, he was a normal virilized male with no granicomastia, and the genital exam was notable for um, descended testes on both sides with a relatively normal volume of 18 cc's where we consider 16 cc's and higher normal. Um, on uh, the epididymes on both sides are flat and non-tender, so no evidence of obstruction there. And he did have palpable vasa bilaterally. Uh, but notably on exam, he had a very large grade three left varicocele. So these are graded by size. And a varicocele that is plainly visible without need for palpation is the largest type, and that is a grade three. So I did look at his hormone profile, especially in light of his um, uh, the low um, uh, motility and total sperm, uh, motile sperm count. His testosterone level was deficient at 184. LH was mildly increased, indicating an attempt at pituitary compensation. FSH was actually normal. Uh, we reviewed that um, the finding of varicocele with him, and initially he was somewhat hesitant. The couple did undergo one cycle of IVF ICSI and generated an embryo that was frozen. But after an, um, I, we identified his uh, testosterone deficiency, he actually reported that he was experiencing some issues with chronic fatigue and he was interested in proceeding to varicocele treatment. So to review a little on varicoceles, up to 35% of men with primary infertility and up to 80% of men with secondary infertility may have a varicocele. Um, this uh, varicoceles cause a progressive decline in fertility. So the longer a gentleman lives with varicoceles, the worse things may actually become as time goes on. And it is the most varicocele treatment or varicocelectomy is the most common uh, procedure performed for male infertility. Uh, studies have shown that elevated testis temperature associated with varicocele is likely the underlying pathology. So the testes live outside of the abdomen and the scrotum, and the ideal temperature for their two functions in life, which is to produce testosterone and sperm, occurs best at 95 Fahrenheit. So when exposed to much higher temperatures chronically, this can cause a heat stress within the testicle, metabolic dysfunction, uh, decrease in sperm production, a decrease in serum testosterone, and also may cause issues with sperm DNA fragmentation and decreased sperm genetic quality. This can sometimes lead to um, changes in the testicle as well, including uh, testicular atrophy. And um, correction of the varicocele can reverse or at least halt any further damage in the majority of treated men. Typically up to 70% of men who are treated will see improvements in semen parameters. So the ideal approach to this is using a microsurgical repair. Um, there are many ways to treat varicoceles, but this method carries uh, the ability to um, 
treat the varicocele with the lowest recurrence rate and the lowest complication rate. So using the microscope, we can identify and preserve all of the essential structures within the spermatic cord on, uh, on the affected side. And this allows us to preserve the testicular arteries, minimizing the risk of testicular atrophy. Preservation of lymphatics also reduces the risk of postoperative hydrocele, which is a benign fluid collection around the testicle. And ligation of all the internal and external spermatic veins can reduce the likelihood of recurrence. The recurrence rate with microsurgical repair is less than 1%, which is the lowest of any form of varicocele treatment. So in this image, it just demonstrates um, a microsurgical approach uh, from a patient of mine where uh, here in this small um, silk loop, I have encircled a, a lymphatic vessel, which is the clear one on the right, and two testicular artery branches adjacent to one another whereas all of the veins in the surrounding cord have been ligated. So our patient underwent an uncomplicated left microsurgical varicoselectomy. Uh, more than six engorged veins were identified and ligated, and we preserved the testicular artery, the vas deferens, and lymphatic channels. At a three-month follow-up, uh, he reports that the frozen embryo transfer was performed and they are now pregnant. But interestingly, his total motile sperm count, which were initially on his two semen analyses at 12 million and 6 million, has now increased to 34 million. His postoperative testosterone level is also climbing. Initially, it was 184, now up to 272. And so our plan right now is to reevaluate his hormone labs and semen analysis at six months from surgery to see if we have any a further increased in, um, improvements. And the hope is that for their next child, they may be successful at natural conception with these improvements. So uh, the second case I want to review um, relates to um, managing idiopathic um, non-obstructive azospermia, another major issue in male infertility. So uh, this patient is a 32-year-old male who came in second opinion after another urologist diagnosed him with non-obstructive azospermia. He has no prior paternity. He does report some issues with libido and weight gain and some erectile dysfunction. His wife is 32. Um, she has uh, had a prior a child conceived naturally with another partner with no difficulty, but notably she has a history of breast cancer and a status post oocyte prior preservation as well. So our patient has no prior history of infections, anabolic steroid use, et cetera. He is otherwise healthy. Um, on outside records, he was uh, found to be hypogonadal at 236 nanograms per deciliter with a slightly elevated FSH and a high F, I'm sorry, slightly elevated LH and a high FSH as well, indicating that there is pituitary attempts at compensation. Um, so for men with azospermia, uh, in terms of genetic testing, there are two tests that we routinely obtain, uh, and this would be a karyotype and Y chromosome microdeletion assay, because these allow us to identify common causes of azospermia in men, including Y chromosome uh, uh, gene deletions, as well as um, chromosome abnormalities such as Klinefelter syndrome. His karyotype was normal. Um, his Y chromosome deletion assay was negative. So in essence, this is an idiopathic case of non-obstructive azospermia. And he did have two semen analyses showing that both had normal volume and normal pH. Uh, but no sperm seen, including on centrifuge uh, pellet examination. So on exam, he is a normal virilized male without gynecomastia, a normal phallus, and his uh, testes are descended on both sides, but they are small for his age. So the right side was estimated at 12 cc's in volume and the left at 8 cc's. Uh, both epididymies were flat and non-tender, indicating lack of any obstruction there. The vasa were palpable, so there's no congenital abnormality, such as uh, congenital absence of the vas deferens, which can cause obstruction in azospermia, and he had no varicoceles identified. So azospermia, in terms of etiology, generally falls into two categories. So there's production issues or obstruction problems. We also define things as the level of uh, failure. So Obstruction would indicate a post-testicular failure, whereas a production issue would be could potentially be either pre-testicular or testicular. So for pre-testicular failure, these can include genetic abnormalities that cause issues typically with endocrinopathy. Um, so uh, these can include uh, the listed genetic abnormalities such as Kalman syndrome, which is um, gonadotropin deficiency, uh, idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, um, prolactinoma, also opioid abuse, this is becoming increasingly uh, prevalent. Um, so men who are chronically exposed to opioids, including those who are on long-term uh, maintenance therapy with uh, methadone or suboxone, have elevated serum prolactin, and that can lead to hypogonadism. 
and subsequent difficulty with fertility. Um, so most of these patients can be addressed with gonadotropin replacement or correction of the underlying problems. So for example, a prolactinoma. In terms of intrinsic testicular failure, so this uh, can be caused by some genetic pathologies, including Klinefelter syndrome or other uh, sex chromosome aneuploidies. Y chromosome microdeletions uh, may cause deletion of essential genes necessary for spermatogenesis, and also other potential causes of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Uh, varicoceles will cause intrinsic testicular failure for the reasons I mentioned previously. Uh, and orchidism, which is rare, but can occur in some men uh, due to uh, usually intrauterine testicular torsion. History of crypt orchidism, which is undescended testicle, um, that will generally cause uh, testicular um, atrophy and dysplasia in some men. Uh, uh, rare conditions are totally cell-only syndrome, where there is a complete absence of the uh, progenitor spermatogonial stem cells. Gonadotoxic therapies, including radiation or even chemotherapy, can cause intrinsic testicular failure. And so for these patients, uh, it's important to medically optimize them to obtain a, a, as close to normal a hormone profile as possible, principally to increase testosterone if there's a testosterone deficiency. And surgical correction of the underlying problem or surgical sperm retrieval can be used as necessary. And lastly, just to um, finish with this segment, so post-testicular failure, again, obstructive pathologies, these can be iatrogenic following vasectomy or vasal ligation during a hernia repair uh, by, uh, for example, a general surgery procedure. Um, they can be post-infection or post-inflammation. So a gentleman with a history of STDs, um, epididymitis or orchitis or genital tuberculosis may develop obstructive pathology. And then there are congenital causes, including anorchidism, as well as absence of the vas deferens. In terms of these, uh, pathologies, the treatment generally is uh, surgical reconstruction, if feasible, versus surgical sperm retrieval. And so in terms of uh, surgery that can be helpful in men who have azospermia, for those who are, have obstructive pathology uh, and a history of vasectomy reversal, you can use, I'm sorry, a history of vasectomy, then you can uh, consider vasectomy reversal through vasovasostomy or vasoepididymostomy. If they have, um, uh, if there are reasons why they would need to pursue IVF ICSI, perhaps there is a female factor issue as well, then you can simply perform microsurgical epididymal sperm aspiration uh, with ICSI. For men who have non-obstructive azospermia, um, varicoselectomy can be helpful uh, at improving the likelihood of um, uh, sperm production or surgical sperm retrieval success. And the gold standard uh, for uh, otherwise idiopathic non-obstructive azospermia is microtessy, which is a microsurgical testicular dissection and sperm extraction. In terms of sperm uh, extraction techniques uh, for uh, non-obstructive azospermia, these very many different techniques have been described. So percutaneous techniques um, typically are a random sampling of testicular tissue. We oftentimes retrieve very few sperm uh, with these blind techniques. It's not ideal if you're planning to cryopreserve a specimen. Um, oftentimes, a sample can be contaminated with other tissue or blood products. An open conventional biopsy was just a, a scrotal incision and um, uh, kind of a random sampling of testicular tissue can remove large volumes of parenchyma and potentially devascularize portions of the testis. And the benefit of the microdissection uh, method is that it optimizes sperm retrieval with a higher success rate than you can obtain with a conventional testicular biopsy. It minimizes tissue removed and risk to testicular architecture. And it's a super selective sampling under microscopic enhanced, uh, microscope enhanced visualization. So if a micro testy is performed in, uh, synchronously with an IVF cycle, a sperm retrieval can be performed at least a day prior to oversight retrieval. Um, it can also be performed in what's called a frozen approach, where sperm are retrieved separately and prior preserved, um, separate from the IVF cycle itself in advance. But this would require adequate numbers of sperm to freeze. So with microtesty and the use of the operating microscope, we can enhance visualization up to 40-fold uh, magnification. This allows us to uh, uh, diagnose obstruction from uh, production issues when the workup is ambiguous. And uh, the sperm retrieval success rates with the microscope-aided dissection is roughly twofold higher than other um, surgical sperm retrieval methods. 
So this image here is to kind of demonstrate how uh, microtessie works. Essentially, we bivalve the testis and then use our magnified vision to identify rare areas of intact sperm production. This can actually be discerned visually. So the image on the right-hand side, um, the thickened tubules that you can see here under 40x power um, are potentially housing sperm production, whereas these thin stringy tubules that almost look um, uh, you know, just very flat and sclerotic are likely to not house any sperm production. So basically we can identify rare areas where spermatogenesis is intact and directly sample those. So once the tissue is obtained, we process it in, uh, in the operating room and take a look at the, the, um, the fluid that's released from the seminiferous tubules under uh, the microscope and can confirm that there are sperm present at the time of surgical sperm retrieval. Um, and so if I am able to find even a few sperm on a quick look at one slide, then I'm fairly confident that the tissue I'm sending to the IVF lab will have plenty of sperm for them to freeze and use. So going back to our case, um, so this gentleman had a hormone profile that uh, we did optimize with three months of clomiphene citrate. We were able to increase his total testosterone level to normal range, and there were appropriate increases under the influence of clomiphene in his LH and FSH levels. A repeat semen analysis was performed, and this did demonstrate a rare non-motile sperm scene, uh, which is very encouraging because it means that there is a sufficient sperm production in the testicle that we're likely to succeed at retrieving surgically. So the sample itself was not sufficient for cryopreservation, but it gives us a very good idea that our prognosis with microtessie will be very good. So he did undergo a uh, uncomplicated right-sided microtessie at the Boston IVF Surgery Center. On visual inspection of the tissue, about one third of the tubules were moderately distended, with uh, two thirds of them flat and sclerotic, as in the previous image. And on intraoperative examination of the seminal seminiferous tubule fluid, uh, we did I, I did identify abundant non-motile whole sperm, and the tissue was then handed off to the andrology team. The final result was that we were able to freeze 10 vials of sperm at about 100,000 cells per milliliter, which is a fairly good number. And I did send a specimen off for pathology as well. The reason I do this is because it gives us an idea of what is going on at the level of the seminiferous tubules in the testicle so that I can give a patient a fair idea of what is going on and what is the general prognosis in terms of any future attempts at sperm retrieval if necessary. So here uh, for this patient, about a quarter of the tubules did have normal sperm production, a quarter did have reduced sperm production, and the remainder had a mix of what's called maturation arrest, which is a defect in sperm maturation. Some tubules had only the supportive cells with no sperm stem cells, and the remainder were sclerotic. So to kind of wrap up at least this, this part of our discussion, um, male infertility does contribute significantly overall to a couple's uh, fertility, infertility, and there are medical and surgical treatment options available. Um, Microsurgical techniques often improve success rates for the treatment of male infertility and can reduce complications. And microsurgical training and skills can be critical for successful male infertility treatment in, in many cases. So I think at this point now, uh, we'd like to open it up to uh, questions from the audience, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Dr. Carasquillo, and thank you, Dr. Vaughn. We are now going to begin, the, begin answering questions from today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. So are there, our first question, I think this one's related to, doc, uh, to Dr. Vaughn. It says, if a woman is on PCPs and wants to check ovarian reserve, should AMH be done alone and what factors can affect AMH? Great, great question. Um, so I'm Wondering if the, by PCPs they mean OCPs, or otherwise it could be progesterone. Yeah, I'm thinking that's what it, what it meant, but yes. But, but e either way, um, so AMH can be affected by um, systemically absorbed contraceptives for sure. Um, in general, uh, it's less; they're less affected. Uh, AMH is less affected by birth control compared to follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. Um, but most of the studies do show that there is about a 20% decrease. That being said, if somebody really did not want to come off OCPs, you could check an AMH. If it's normal on OCPs, it's going to be normal off OCPs. If it's low on OCPs, then you could take stop the OCPs, uh, give her a four to six week break, and then recheck the the levels. But um, in general, 
um, the next plan or, or any systemic uh, contraception could affect the AMH. And, and so for that reason, in general, we try to stop um, hormonal contraception where possible um, before testing ovarian reserve. And, you know, obviously we don't look at just AMH in isolation. We would recommend that you do gonadotropins as well as the natural folic account to try to get as complete a picture as you can. Um, that being said, we do have a lot of patients who come in for egg freezing with um, IUDs, progesterone IUDs in place, and we don't remove those. Uh, we check an AMH and an antral folic account, and that's sufficient. There's generally less systemic absorption from those IUDs anyway, um, and they don't affect our stimulation. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. The next question is directed to Dr. Carasquillo. When is it appropriate to refer to a reproductive urologist? Yeah, so I think it's helpful, um, you know, if the patient is being evaluated by their PCP or perhaps uh, by their partner's uh, um, OBGYN, you know, it's helpful to start off with a semen analysis. If the semen analysis has an abnormality, always ideal to get a second a few weeks later just for comparison. Semen analysis is a very sensitive process and counts and motility can vary um, very rapidly within weeks or days. Um, and so we want to see that there's a consistent problem. And if there are abnormalities on at least two semen analyses, then it would be appropriate at that point to have a gentleman seen by a reproductive urologist. Also, if they have any other concerns regarding their sexual function, libido, erections as well, then that can also be addressed at the same time. And that would be an appropriate reason to send someone. Thank you. We have another question I think that's directed to you, Dr. Carasquillo. After the male patient has had a procedure like a varicocele surgery, how long does it take for them to resume treatment? Yeah, so typically if we want to see what the benefits of the surgery are, uh, we typically repeat testing of hormones and semen analysis at about three months. So the entire sperm production cycle takes a little over 70 days. And so there can be a little bit of an investment in time in terms of seeing those improvements. Um, if, for example, we're trying to treat a varicocele in the hopes of improving a couple's um, IVF success, then I would at least you know, give them the three months time to allow him to recover uh, spermatogenesis um, and um, improve his hormone profile and, and then consider continuing treatment at that point. Thank you. Our next question is, how far apart should the semen analysis be, the repeat? Uh, typically, it's recommended at least maybe in the ballpark of four to six weeks apart. Um, certainly, you don't want them too close together uh, because if there was, um, you know, some explanation for a poor semen analysis, if the gentleman had recently had a febrile illness, the flu, or even COVID, for example, um, then you want them to have some recovery time. Um, so, on the order of four to six weeks is ideal. Okay, and this is our last question so far, unless we have any, oh, so you can still ask a question, but this is our last we have. Um, just regarding the surgeries for the male, are they painful and how long is the recovery afterwards? Yeah, so by and large, these are not you know, ex extremely painful. Soreness is expected. Um, Recovery-wise, I usually recommend either for varicocele or, or surgical sperm retrieval, you know, uh, two weeks of reduced physical activity, such as sports or heavy lifting or sexual activity to allow things to heal up. And largely everyone is able to go back to normal activity after about two weeks. They usually don't require a ton of pain medication. They usually provide anywhere from five to 10, you know, kind of medium strength narcotic like oxycodone, but most people don't require more than two or three days worth of medication like that. And otherwise Tylenol and ibuprofen are adequate. So it's, a, it's pretty minor. Thank you. And we have one more for Dr. Vaughn. What do you recommend for tubal patency? Um, good question. I, you could do a ideally a hysteroscopingogram, um, which requires obviously access to x-ray um, and a C-arm that in general is the most sensitive. However, we do more and more uh, high cozies or saline uh, sonohistograms in our office. And you know, you can agitate just saline and watch the bubbles go out through the cornea. Um, and confirm tubal patency in the office that way. And, and as I said, it has the advantage of not requiring the X-ray equipment. And even if the visualization isn't perfect, if you do an ultrasound before the um, before you instill fluid into the cavity and 
there is no fluid in the cul-de-sac and you, re you repeat the uh, ultrasound while you're doing the procedure and you might not clearly see the bubbles but afterwards there's free fluid in the uh, cul-de-sac then clearly and um, there's tubal patency um, and that that alone is sufficient at least confirming one tube is patent um, for a couple. Thank you, Dr. Vaughn, and thank you, Dr. Carasquillo. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, Evaluation and Treatment of the Infertile Male. If you have any other questions, please con you can contact myself, Alyssa Cooper, at ecooper at bostonivf.com. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you could complete the survey to, pro to provide your feedback to help with future educational webinars. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Boston IVF, Dr. Dennis Vaughn and Dr. Robert Carasquillo, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.